So I think uh, before I start, maybe I the the reason I give this title because I think we've been all concerned about this, and then also I think as a as a center. Uh, uh, by the way, I think Professor Wu has mentioned it. I think NUS and Tsinghua has a center. We call it NEX. This stands for NUS Tsinghua Center for Extreme Research. And this has been going on since 2010. And in fact, I first discussed with Professor Sumo Song is 2008. So actually, the history of this actually has gone more than 10 years. Yeah. And before I give the talk, I, I usually like to explain the meaning behind my name. Actually, in fact, if you look closely at information from different angles, actually you can derive a lot of information. Right? First of all, this name Chua Ta Seng, right? this is very Southeast Asia. If you see this name, it has to be from Singapore or Malaysia. <laughs> yeah. And this name is unique, of course, you type Chua Ta Seng and there's only one, which is nice for me, I think. Secondly, if you look at the name, Chinese name and the English name, you know that I'm uh, from Southern Fujian province. I'm a uh, Minan. Because the name is pronounced is, uh, in Minan, Minan Hua, actually. So actually, in Singapore, if you look at the English name and the Chinese name, you can actually, to 90% accuracy, you can guess what dialect this person is in. Okay. So I think just for here, just to highlight that actually, for everything we see, if we look at actually from different angles, different perspectives, actually you can derive a lot of information without actually having to go a step further. Yeah. So I think that that's that's a starting point of my talk. And first of all, I'd like to kind of uh, paint the uh, give some idea about the trends in AI. I think as I mentioned, everything there's a kind of multiple angle of looking at things, right? And in social media and uh, and, and the web, actually. You can see information coming from public domain sources, for example, user-generated content, device-generated contents. In fact, most useful information comes from the web sources, from uh, web search engine, forums, e-commerce sites, and so on. And uh, increasingly, we are using knowledge. Of course, right now, our, no our perception of knowledge is basically knowledge graph. And of course, as we, as we go on to move, do bigger and bigger projects, in fact, the kind of domain knowledge, uh, kind of uh, 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 offline data, domain data, industry data, and all things play a bigger part. Right? So in fact, the bigger trend actually is now that we need to be able to integrate multiple sources of information. Uh, five years ago, I think when we do research, we typically use public domain sources. I think they see lots of research, they are used Twitter to derive this, derive that. But of course, Underneath all this research, actually, there's a lot of assumptions. Right? And then, actually, at the beginning, I think we make it explicit. So, until three years ago, I think people start to look at knowledge graph as part of the analysis. And also, we are start to incorporate a lot of internal structured data. For example, in FinTech, basically, you, you incorporate company data, domain data, and so on. And hopefully, this whole thing is basically to make an AI platform more intelligence so as to support human experts in making better decisions. Yeah. And so for next, I think basically we are looking to research into three information sources, big data, noise handling, knowledge interpolation, and so on. Second trend I see will be the emergence of uh, deep learning. Yeah, I think uh, we can see a lot of success in AI. I think starting with ImageNet, which about four years ago, I think Microsoft has the first paper that claims that computer actually has performed better than human in terms of image recognition. But of course, in the context of image that, that has been kind of tuned for more than 10 years. And of course, follow that, there are lots of other success stories that the, in, uh, in medical imaging and everything, everybody claims that their system is better than experts. Uh, voice recognition, uh, and, and other parts. And of course, the other thing is IBM Watson actually kind of performed better than humans. But of course, if you look behind this one, this is basically a, a factoid-based question-answering kind of problems. And if you can gather a lot of information, actually you can basically answer most of the questions. And the next big thing, of course, is AlphaGo. I think uh, AlphaGo starts from uh, uh, learning for humans to self-learning and then to basically able to handle noise and so on. 
And uh, so the common characteristics of this, these are all actually in clean vertical domain. So in fact, that give us to the second trend, which is actually, actually I borrowed this from Professor Tan actually. The criteria for success, first of all, is big data. Secondly, is computing resources. Then one, of course, we need effective algorithms. And of course, uh, the other thing that we actually forget is that we must have a nice vertical domain. And underlying that is that we have clean data. Right? If you got these five criteria, I think the deep learning will perform very well. And in fact, that has been demonstrated over and over again. And uh, so a lot of work is basically trying to basically dig away from this and then actually how to ensure that the data is sufficiently clean. And there are lots of opportunity in medical, self-driving, education, and energy, and so on. Right? And the trend number three I see will be, I think people start to, with the success of AI, people start to look at accountability for AI. Yeah. What are the problems that societal and, 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 and social problems that this will arise? For example, data access issues, algorithm accountability, predictability of results and performance, and then ethical and, and legal issues. Right. Of course, uh, things can go wrong, but always go wrong. I think the, the first most famous case will be the Cambridge Analytics, that they make use of uh, users' data to actually do a lot of other things right, that they are not supposed to be used. Uh, the first accident on the self-driving car, and then, of course, the fake news. In fact, the, the generation of fake news, fake images, and fake video is so good that actually you need actually technology to even detect whether that's real or fake. And this, this becomes important because this company claims that their, their technology is so good that they voluntarily withdraw the technology from the market. Of course, this is more for publicity. But of course, you can see the, the implications of that. And uh, because of that, I think every country has set up advisory committees and things like that. I just quote Singapore. So, so Singapore, we form a, a committee to look into ethical use of AI. Of course, uh, uh, EU, I think they also have that. And then, in fact, they have a, a guideline, set up guidelines on how AI should be used. And uh, uh, among them is basically accountability, explainability, and bias as well. Yeah. So I guess as a community, I think we begin to look at explainability in the AI, that because uh, uh, deep learning is basically a black box, and uh, all these technologies are basically black box based models, and the and, and so so even though it has big high performance, but you also have you also tend to make occasional big mistakes, and in a way, the results of deep learning is actually well we cannot fully trust the results, especially for critical domain applications. I think this is a slide I borrowed from DAPA. That currently we are here, if you look at the curve of performance versus explainability, we are somewhere here. And what we hope is to push it up to the next level, that we have high performance as well as high explainability. Okay. So the ex uh, explainable AI aims to maintain high level performance. Hopefully, it's not worse than deep learning. And secondly, that you enable human to understand. And in fact, that's one of the definitions of explainer. That means a human operator needs to work with machine. So human operator needs to be able to understand the decision made by the machine. And with this, then we are able to kind of uh, apply AI to critical, mission critical operations like FinTech, healthcare, and other things. Okay, so, so I think this is outline a bit of kind of research for under next, I think we have three key challenges. One is basically big data, uh, how to learn from multiple channel data, how to do expandable deep learning for recommendation and conversation systems, video relation inference, multi-model chatbot and conversation, and then the big data wellness systems. The other challenge I see is kind of more paradigm change. I think we, we are shifting from video to 3D now, so in fact, uh, VR, 3D, all these are becoming a, a reality. And also, to me, is I think as we work on explainability, the key problem is actually it's easy to give explanation. But what is the quality of explanation? And how does explanation help users in the long run? So in a way, I kind of put it down as we move away from recommendation, one of recommendation to inducements. How do we help users to be 
kind of more effective in the long run. And of course, the other thing will be the insights. Yeah. How can we ensure explainability, predictability, robustness, and all the features that we hope in the system, in the trustable computer systems? So I'll kind of quickly get into this because I think of the limit of time. Explainable AI. I kind of see the framework. We have basically work on three level framework. The first level of framework is basically looking at things that are explainable. For example, decision tree, knowledge graph, explainable tree graph. Of course, you have to support all these desirable properties. And current system basically are based on two ways of achieving explainability. One is basically for attribute rich problem, that the system itself is explainable. And the second is post hoc interpretability is for attribute poor problem, for example, image recognition. The system itself is not explainable, and we need to design an additional model to achieve explainability. And a lot of things that we have not done a lot will be kind of human evaluations. I think we are very good in statistical criteria, but statistical criteria doesn't say much about the quality of the systems. In fact, the human level uh, uh, indication and things like that are more important. And so these are the three levels I'll be kind of quickly go through. So first I will look at kind of an intrinsic interpretability, whereby we look at problems which are attribute rich and it itself is explainable. So in fact, I, I think next year EU is going to start a uh, law that the, all the recommendation systems should be explainable. And in fact, two years ago I went to ask most of the high tech company, I think nobody is worried about this. Because I think privacy is something they have to do a lot of work, but explainability is something that's natural for any of the e-commerce systems. I can always give you an explanation. But of course, the, the things I mentioned is actually the quality. Okay. So one approach that we are looking at is basically to, with an attribute-rich problem, we can actually make use of decision tree to extract the, the multiple rules, uh, uh, random forest, that kind of thing or through knowledge graph, or combination of them to infer list of decision rules. But of course, we all know, by looking at just inference rules, the performance is not good. And so one typical approach is basically to make use of these inference rules as a cross feature. So instead of just pumping simple feature into deep learning, we basically look at cross features that are learned through uh, systems, and with the cross features, in a way, we show that we, you don't need to be very deep. You just have to be three layer deep with uh, attention model. In a way, you can think of it, the deep learning is basically used to assign ways to the, to the cross inference rule to achieve the performance of deep learning. And in this way, you are able to kind of uh, achieve the performance of deep learning, and at the same time, you are able to give explanation. So this one example that, that was published in 2018 in Worldwide Web is basically on the e-commerce problems. We can actually make use of decision rules to come up with a, with a set of decision rules that help you to reach these decisions. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, each of the rules will be considered as a cross-feature. And in fact, one of the hardest problems is basically to identify which are the cross-features or obviously so-called higher-level features that can be used for deep learning. And then, uh, and then we employ a three-layer deep learning with attention model to identify the weights of all these cross features. And then we basically use that as a basis for explanation. So currently, basically, we just use the most dominant rules. But of course, this is, might not be satisfactory. So the key observation is that we use inference rules as cross features. And then enable the use of shallow deep learning model to, 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 to basically identify the weights and also identify the the key rules and able to achieve both accuracy and explainability. Then we apply that to a fashion domain where we have additional steps of extracting the fashion features and then apply the same other things. We also apply that to healthcare, whereby we have a knowledge graph of <laughs> basic food ingredients to nutrition and then to, uh, to critical illnesses. So, so basically, from what you eat, and then to the objective of achieving low cholesterol uh, and so on, what are the kind of food items that, that are kind of uh, uh, good for the users. 
And then uh, again, so this one come up with lots of decision rules, and then basically apply that to a, a, a deep learning model, uh, shadow deep learning model to identify the ways of the rules, and hopefully can achieve the performance of uh, deep learning systems. And at the same time, it's able to give explanations. Okay, the other approach of deep learning will be basically the kind of post hoc interpretability. I think most of us are working on image recognition, uh, voice recognition, and so on. Basically, the features are, are kind of simple features. This, this. So, so the only thing you can do is say, can, can I identify patches of the feature that correspond to some key concerns? Right? So, in fact, that's what we are planning to do. In basically, so we look at the problem as Given a black box model and an instance of, of low uh, feature of simple attributes, and we want to understand the decision made by the black box Y. So one way to do it is basically, can we identify a group of features that correspond to the decision and is understandable to the humans? These are the two examples. For example, for, for this sentence, I think we want, if we want to determine the sentiment of this sentence, <coughs> To analysis, I guess we can zoom into yeah, these two words are the two words that help you to determine that this is a negative sentence. And if you want to identify is this picture is about cats, right? I guess we can zoom in eventually to say I, I know this is cat because of the face here. And and I guess Professor Chitman is talking about it basically work on causal reasoning to say. The combination of eyes, mouth, whiskers, and things like that, that gives you a cat-like features, and then so you identify that this is cat. Right? So the framework is basically kind of a feature selection. You want to select a group of features, and then use that to mimic the behavior of the black box model. And then, so the, the key research is basically look at mutual information. I think here I put down two papers that are done by Eric group. I think these are just some examples. I think there are lots of folks work, work, working on that. To, to basically, to information, to mutual information, to identify optical model that extract as much as possible common information between Y and some representation of X. And use that to basically identify empty. Oh, sorry. And this could be a, a, a patch in the image, or could be, could be two features within text and so on. Yeah, if we kind of do directly on this, uh, this is actually an intractable problem. So there's no, no solution. So, so in fact, most of the implementation will basically look into design of a single neural network for parameterizing the lower bound of the uh, uh, mutual information. And then they run through, through a kind of sampling process to identify a set of features that kind of uh, uh, best Dominant features that are that help to explain these particular decisions. Yeah. The current approach, I think, the key problem is that is first of all it could be inconsistent because the the process of identifying one feature or two features and three features could be different because the because they basically look at different subsets and then do subsampling. So the two features might not be part of three features and so on. And secondly, it's not, not, not producible. Right? So with, with this kind of uh, inconsistency and non-producibility, it's actually hard to achieve uh, a, a good deep learning kind of performance. Yeah. So one way that we look at is that instead of looking at it, can we look at the kind of screening model to, to achieve that? So basically, the difference between screening and, and, and mutual information is that basically in screening, we look at all the features and then try to identify a, a dominant features. And then you do it in a recursive manner. And you can prove that this one has a property of able to remove redundancy and irrelevance. And also, most importantly, it has monotonic property that the, the single feature or two feature and three feature, they are, they are consistent, that, 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 that they will all be inclusive there. So we basically employ a basic <coughs> dimensionality approach to, to achieve this. And this is one framework that we look at. First of all, given the domain, you try to identify all the important labels, and then we perform the, the neuron. As you go from layer to layer, you can look at it as a dimensional reduction process through the, uh, 
kind of a intrinsic dimension and these features. The, this, meta, this paper just is going to identify when the dimension reduction process stops and, the, and it starts to expand. And this signals the, the place where the noise starts to creep in. Right? And then basically, kind of a, and at the point of maximum dimension reduction, we hope that all the neurons are actually well clustered. And hopefully, these clusters are actually correspond to the concept that we want to perform in this particular task. So we can neuron, organize the neuron pairs into the so-called explanatory tree, and then use this tree to basically do, do, do perform the explanation. And such idea has been used in the past. For example, four years ago, one of the most well-publicized paper by UC Berkeley to explain how I know that this is a Western grabber. What, why is this? Because from the Wikipedia definition, I know this bird has a black head, yellow beads, a bit of black wing. And the system is able to kind of identify these features. And from these features, you can then able to explain why this particular bird is present. Similarly, I think one of the recent, I think, kind of high impact paper on GAN dissection is able to kind of associate different features on the image with neurons. So for example, the, in the demo, they are able to show that I can actually edit the tree without affecting all the other parts. I can remove the trees, I can add in different trees, and so on. So the whole idea is basically similar, that I can be able to associate a set of neurons to, to some kind of a, a conditional mutual information to, to, to concepts, and I can use that to manipulate concepts or use that to explain the results of the analysis. And of course, one thing we want to think of is if I can do it this way, of course I can go backwards. Then maybe I can use that to design a better neural models for the analysis. Okay, so quickly, I think able to explain is of course insufficient. I think as I mentioned earlier, in the attribute rich problem, I can always give you an explanation. Right? The question is, what is the quality of explanation? So one other idea that we work on together with, I think, Professor Sang Min and uh, Liu Yixin actually is basically to look at, can we assess the different level of quality assessment <coughs> that applies both recommendation and conversation systems? To me, the system has to be able to help users, first of all, to accomplish the task. To, to accomplish what kind of explanation should I give to the users, or, or guide should I give to the users. Second level is how to help users to perform future tasks. So, so my guide to the user <coughs> might not be just uh, a simplicity of helping the user to accomplish the task with a minimum number of steps, but maybe to see how can my guidance help to enrich users in, in knowing the systems and and of course the the longer term will be long term knowledge accumulation. In, in wellness domain, for example, I teach you about wellness, so in fact next time you, you don't need to rely so much on my systems. You basically you you interact with the system at a much higher level. So I think we are working with Professor Zhang Min and Professor Liu Yi Shin of Tsinghua University actually to, to do this kind of user based studies. And uh, in terms of quality, I think we need to know predictability that that that, that the user should have some level of predictability, uh, able to predict the results of the systems, robustness, that any variations within the data will not affect the prediction accuracy, and privacy. Actually, explainability and privacy are opposite. Right? And so, so here is basically how to give explanation without revealing the privacy of the users. And then finally, of course, is fairness. Fairness to me is kind of more the data distribution kind of problems. And uh, in terms of evaluation, I think as I mentioned, this is important. I think we, we always look at, from the technical point of view, we always look at it from statistical criteria. But I think this is not sufficient. We need to look at from user satisfaction, task performance, and mental model. But, <laughs> so all of these things are actually just beginning. Uh, here is, I just quickly run through this because I think for the lack of time, I think. So basically, there are lots of in interpretable knowledge learners that I kind of roughly mentioned. And at this level, we got look at the 
the interpretive by design the system is interpretable and then the close out basically we need to design additional system to provide explanation. And of course the interpretive can be globally interpretable or locally at rules level. And then uh, we can look at it at the, as a working mechanism, model, or individual, and then the key factors. I mentioned about seven <coughs> key factors, but, but these are all part of it. And the most importantly, we need to bring in human-based evaluations. <coughs> so I think this, this is calls for actually multidisciplinary approach to basically look at this experiment by AI type of problems. Uh, I will just quickly talk a bit about deep video semantics. To me, semantics is actually another way of providing explanation because if you don't know what's going on in the video, oops, sorry. So this is basically one of the videos that has been taking me packed with all the things as well as the relations. So the father comes in, the mother comes in, and so on. So basically the focus here is, is the focus of this research is to go beyond object recognition to relation inference. And the relation inference to me is you have to be done at the video level because for image level type of relation inference actually is quite meaningless because you are just guessing. And so actually we, we spent one year actually just to tag 10,000 data set. And then uh, so this being used in, so, 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 to be, so, so this is basically part of a, uh, so, so once I have this, I, actually the semantics of video can be brought up to the level of language. Because at the, le at the level of object, predicate, subject. And then actually language and video, Semantics cannot be can can then be merged together and analyzed together. So in terms of research, I think first of all, given a video, I want to know the objects, I want to know their relationship. The second level of research you can look at is given this, can I infer something higher about this video? I think this is about happy family and things like that. In fact, then it's reasonable to basically able to predict that the mother might go on to have the maybe the kind of things, right? So overall, the research that we're trying to look at is basic one is video relation inference. Given this video, I think I can describe this video in multiple ways, from this mother's point of view, from this boy's point of view, and so on. Multi-perspective description, video QA, and then the uh, causal reasoning, and then of course this multi-modal knowledge graph. Okay, just to round up, I think uh, uh, directions for good AI research. I think that this was a talk I give in China about future of multimedia research. So I thought I just so basically deep learning is here to stay. I think whether we like it or not, I think for the right problems, right data, actually deep learning is very effective. And it should be embraced, but of course we need to learn to do accountable research in deep learning. I think that's a populist emphasis that we try to put on for next. My ticket for good AI research, my, well, actually for good multimedia research, that we, they should involve multi-channel data. We should not stop at technology. We put accuracy. I think accuracy is probably one of the criteria that we at Catholic actually fixated upon. But actually, robustness is actually more important than accuracy but for, for applications. Yeah. And we should go beyond deep learning and knowledge graph. I think uh, I think Professor Zhang Hua has mentioned that many times that actually machine learning actually is more than deep learning, right? And, and in fact, we, we are actually so fixed. Uh, well, we should look at more, and also knowledge graph is just one representation. I think if you want to represent contextual knowledge, you probably need to look into other types of knowledge, like frames, schema, and, and other type of knowledge representations. Care about insights and then uh, should look into users and solutions. Yeah. So as my last slides, I think uh, it's an exciting area that we're in. Uh, we need disruptive ideas to move forward. And uh, I'll just keep this. Basically, we should do end-to-end -end research from tech to solution. Okay, we need to look at solutions and users, and finally, it gives us the opportunity to. Yeah. So I think I'll just stop here. Yeah, thank you.
sorry, I just like to acknowledge. I think part of my slides on uh, on 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 explainable AI actually come from Wendy Hall, and uh, and actually a lot of slides actually come from discussion with Professor Chang, and, and these are my four postdocs that help me in a lot of the works, and then of course before the professor from Chick White so on actually I come on in service. Yeah, thank you. Any questions for Professor Chai? From your opinion, uh, for the AI direction, what kind of mathematics would be sure that you have? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I guess the, as I mentioned, the, the, in fact, a lot of statistical techniques, Bayesian learning and things like that, these are, these are important. Uh, for, for us, I think, as in the computer science side, we, we tend to be the, we, we basically pick the best model and then we, we actually basically more adaptation to the to, to the systems. But to me actually a lot of things that the, the mathematical science can contribute. I think just now when I talk about post-hoc kind of uh, explanation, yeah, we, we need actually better model to identify features. Uh, 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 and, and and in terms of integration of knowledge and and, and and deep learning, I think a lot of us basically we look at embeddings and so on, but I think we need to go beyond embedding as well. So that we can preserve better knowledge structures. In, uh, in in addition to come up with good performance, we, we actually need to preserve the knowledge structure to, to, to provide good explanation and, and, and future performance. But you have said your client academia should be the industry. I think the reality is it's the other way, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think who is, who famously say that if anything. I, I think we lose to act, we lose the industry because we are too fixated with those uh, 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 kind of challenge and things like that, which you need a lot of a lot of GPUs and things like that, and we lose to them in a lot of this, and there's an impression that we are actually behind. But my feeling is, I think somebody famously said that if I can solve this problem by buying uh, by putting one billion dollars and come up with a big big. Uh, Computing resource center, and we can improve our research that way. This is not research. So I feel I think we should look at more basic parameter research. I think a lot of work that this center is doing, and then a lot of things that we hope to do that will basically get into the more fundamental aspects of deep learning, knowledge representation, and machine learning. Yeah. This is just my personal view, but of course I think all of you has. Uh, Better feeling for this one. Okay. Uh, let's thank Professor Tang. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye